for joining us today for Talent Mobility, Building Human Connections Beyond the Candidate Lifecycle. I'm Raquel Lawrence, Marketing Manager at Smashfly, and I'm so glad you could all be a part of this discussion along with our experts, Smashfly's own Brandy Ellis and Intel's Tyler Weeks. Before we get started, just a few announcements and housekeeping items. First, today's session will be recorded and a link to the recording and slides will be sent to your inbox by the end of this week. So based on GoToWebinar's default settings, you're currently listening in using your computer's speaker system. But if you'd like to join us over the phone, just select phone call in the audio pane to the right of your screen and the dial-in information will be displayed. After the presentation, we'll leave about 10 minutes for Q&A. So you can submit your questions throughout the webinar using the questions pane of the control panel over to your right. Brandy and Tyler are super excited to get your feedback on all the ideas and examples you'll be uh, seeing today. So feel free to let us know how we're doing. Um, over in the chat pane, you can simply send us a happy face emoticon when you like a point or a sad one if you're maybe confused or disagree with a point. Uh, just any kind of feedback you want to throw in there, we're welcome to hear it. Lastly, don't forget to say hi on Twitter. Uh, you can tweet us at Smashfly anytime. We'd love to hear from you. So now, without further ado, I'm very happy to welcome our two speakers today, Brandy Ellis and Tyler Weeks. So uh, take it away, Brandy. Thanks, Raquel. Um, hi, everybody. I am Brandy, and I am the head of recruitment marketing strategy and services at Smashfly. And that really just means that I have a really cool position that allows me to work with a lot of our very large customers on um, CRM strategy and content and just doing really cool things. And uh, one of those really cool things is webinars with people like Tyler. So that's enough about me. What about you, Tyler? <laughs> um, yeah, this is fun, Brandy. So I, I, I manage a team. We call ourselves the A team because it's lots of A's. It's talent acquisition, analytics, and automation. So we do everything from forecasting and modeling to um, you know, bringing in more advanced technologies to, to help our recruiters run faster and jump higher. So. Uh, this is kind of fun fun to be here with you. So we did announce that you are broadcasting from a secret location. Where are I you am, coming to us from? I, I am coming to you from uh, from Tel Aviv. I'm in Israel for a week with uh, a bunch of colleagues uh, trying to plan our next big thing we want to do. So kind of fun yeah. to be here. Yeah. So that's, that's a big secret. <laughs> I suppose we should dive in. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, what the concept that we really want to convey are a couple of things. One, quality over quantity. You're going to hear that a couple of times throughout the presentation and relationships over resumes. And um, I didn't include that I come from a talent acquisition background. I was a sales recruiter for at least 15 years. We're not going to put a number on it. It's just it's been a while. Um, before I moved into recruitment marketing and employer brand. And so I realized some of the things that we're going to say today potentially are going to sound a little wild and crazy, especially if you're sitting in a recruiter seat um, and listening to this call. But hopefully, um, by, the, by the time we get to the end of it, everybody will at least send us a bunch of smiley faces. And Raquel did mention um, that we're going to ask for smiley faces and happy faces. Tyler's probably going to plug a couple of questions. So we do hope that you're going to be paying attention throughout. Um, because he will be plugging a couple of live questions. So why is this important? And we know we talk about pipelines, we talk about obviously we're a Smashfly and we're a CRM, but why, why does this conversation matter? Well, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says currently the average tenure of an employee is about 4.2 years. And in, if you look at Silicon Valley, a data scientist is averaging about 18 months with an employer. And so over a lifespan of a career that could go 40 to 50 years, um, which, you know, I'm only about halfway through mine, so it still seems like a really long time, our companies then have an opportunity to court people a minimum of 10 to 25 different times throughout their lifetime as they're getting ready to make another career change. And so instead of thinking about the moment in time that we need someone, we need to be focusing on the moments in time throughout that lifespan that we could potentially capture that talent. But regardless of what we need to do, imagine this. 
and this is one of our customers, um, your company receives approximately 3 million applicants a year, you make approximately 130,000 hires, simple math says that's roughly 2.9 million people who are told thanks but not today. And so what are we doing about that? That is creating an experience and all of those people are going through a process and then falling off and going back into this black hole that we've been talking about, it seems like, most of my career. So some of you that have been on presentations with me before have probably seen this slide. Um, employment is just a part of the human experience. It's, it's something we have to do, or at least, you know, the 1% the probably don't, but the rest of us, we're going to have to work. And so employers today, especially engineering companies and any of the STEM organizations, are starting to recruit earlier and earlier. You know, um, energy companies in the West Coast are beginning to do engagement programs with kindergartners doing science fairs to begin to, one, get people interested in STEM, but two, there's a lovely benefit that if your company organized all of this great stuff when you were a child, then you probably are building some brand loyalty at the same time. So part of what we need to do is shift our mentality and think about that full life cycle of a worker instead of just, again, the moment in time. So the second part is that the diagram that you see here, it's not a straight line. The candidate experience isn't linear. Our human experience isn't linear. You know, my career, Tyler's career, they're very different. I'm sitting in Raleigh, he's sitting in Tel Aviv. Not the same journey so far. So we need to start thinking about people as individuals and then nurturing throughout all of these moments that matter throughout their career. And throughout their career, they're developing different knowledge, skills, and abilities and experiences that at any moment in time could then qualify them or make them really interesting to our company. Yeah, you know, we we got obsessed with this uh, a few years ago of, of this this idea of like the, the arc of somebody's career, like this lifetime of the candidate, um, and and the same and this uh, the pipeline to nowhere, right? We we've taken all these candidates. Intel has a strong brand. We get lots of people interested in our jobs, uh, and we hire a relatively small percentage of them. Um, but you know, if I looked at my resume or Brandy, I'm assuming if you looked at your resume from 10 years ago and you had to decide whether or not to hire yourself for your current job, um, you know, oh, no. would you <laughs> would you hire <laughs> yourself from your current job based on your resume 10 years ago? Nope, nope, no, probably not. not right? You 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 go into that pipeline to nowhere. But now you're here and you're definitely qualified. So having just rejected you and given you a horrible experience doesn't make sense because even if you were the worst, even if I was the worst interview in Intel's history for my current job 10 years ago, now I'm here and I, I'm, I, at least I think I'm called, I, 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 if there's anyone here <laughs> from Intel that disagrees, don't say anything, but I think I can do this job. Um, so we got obsessed with this, this arc of the career and we, to us, this looked like an infinity loop. Like we, we bring people in and, you know, they go through the rec application process and then, and then what do we want to do with them? We want to nurture them and keep them interested and, and develop a relationship so that when they do have the qualifications we need, um, we're ready and we're there. Uh, similar to this kind of nonlinear uh, experience that you're, you're talking about. Yeah. And of course, you know, Intel does great things and um, we agree. This is, this is something that we want to change the conversation. So um, we at Smash Y, who love Tyler and his team have kind of borrowed the infinity loop concept and really want to make sure that all of us are amplifying this idea of taking that moment from awareness through the human journey with the person instead of just the person who is potentially applying for interviewing for that job in the moment. Which by the way, Tyler, I appreciate you saying that I'm qualified for my role now. I that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, if anybody from Smash Live is on the call and you disagree, um, please don't put a frowny face. 
So when we say qualified for our jobs, right, there's so much that goes into that. One of the things that we really try and emphasize is understand your pipelines and understand your people. And I am obsessed with personas and journey maps. And the reason for that is when we develop a persona, it is, it is a thorough look at someone's interest, their media interest, their media consumption. Um, what, what are their triggers when they're making a decision? What are their buying habits and things that make them excited or things that make them mad? At the same time, we're looking at not just, and for this example, is Dr. Dennis. Well, we're not looking at just a dentist in a specific geography. We're looking at the human that is in that role. And then mapping out when they begin to think about a moment in time where they're becoming aware that they need to find a new role or they want to find a new role, what is that, what are they doing, thinking, and feeling at that time? And we map that out to really understand what our opportunities are to nurture them over time. And then importantly, do your research. You know, similar with the persona and the journey map, um, understand your personas to then create content strategies and speak to these humans and leverage the moments that matter. And the blue arrow here is really important because it applies to Gen Z. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the Gen Z, those are born between 1997 and 2012, which seems really recent. So not all of them are entering the workforce yet, but some of them are. And given the historically low unemployment that we're seeing right now, this generation is an on-demand generation. They want things fast, they want things quick. And in a traditional journey map that we've seen for more seasoned professionals that are not Gen Z, this apply process is later in the journey. They'll do the research. They'll figure out maybe if your company is right for them, <clears throat> excuse me, based on what they're seeing in the market. Well, the younger generations are not doing that. And so I don't know about you guys, Tyler, but if a recruiter gets a resume from a person or if a hiring manager gets a call from a person and, and they say, oh, what job was this that I applied for right off the bat? That's probably not going to leave a very good experience, right? Yeah, that happens more. I think that probably happens more to all of us than we than we like to admit. <laughs> but that's that's where we're going, unfortunately or fortunately. It's just a shift, and so if we understand that that is coming, then we can act differently and potentially capture that really great talent that is just behaving like the rest of the talent in that area. Yeah. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that, Brandy, is that you know, like the one-click apply um, has really mm -hmm. changed the game here because you can't trust that even an application, like you're saying, is real interest. Um, so you, you know, even even approaching your applicants, um, you have to approach them almost like a like a market segment, right? You have to approach them and, and really yeah. pulse their interest and 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 see where they're at. So, yeah, absolutely, it's kind of a fascinating shift in in how and how we look at the people in our, our ATS and CRM. And that's, that's very much where uh, you queued up really well as a market segment. Um, start changing the conversation with talent. It's kind of one of the key takeaways of this message today is we are promoting jobs. We are promoting why our company should be the next big decision for the talent out there. And instead, we're not thinking about the talent going through these giant milestones in their lives. You know, getting married, kind of important. Having kids, some people call that a big deal. You know, uh, retiring families or aging parents or any number of things. These are all happening to people as they're going through this thing called life and they're hopefully working at the same time. And so if we as a company excel, in one thing or another, you know, if you have an amazing paternity program or an amazing maternity program, why not ask people if they're interested in learning more about being a mom at Intel or being a mom at Smashfly or the maternity programs and benefits at Intel or Smashfly? Speak to the human and capture that emotional reaction based on where they are in their moment in time. And then they're naturally going to build some brand affinity for you. But 
interest in you know these sort of stories and life events, it only gets us one side of the human. Um, the other side is if they're actually qualified to do the job. Yeah, I, you know, one of the one of the big mistakes that I see made is um, is confusing the confusing interest and ability. Uh, and I, I think this is intuitive. I think we all understand this, but we still make the mistake. Somebody applies for a job, um, or just because somebody applies for a job doesn't mean they're capable of the job. It means they're interested. And likewise, just because their resume says that they have an ability, it doesn't mean they're necessarily interested. So it's it's understanding the two. It's when those two things line up that you you have an opportunity. So if they have one or the other, all that does is really dictate how you engage them. If you if you have a resume, or if you have some information about where they've been or what they've done, um, it's you, you now understand something about what you need to do to engage that person. You know, interest is a lot like hunger, right? It changes. You know, after I have a, a big meal, I don't want to see any commercials about food. Uh, but that could change an hour from now. Um, so interest is about intersecting them at the right time and in the right way. Uh, and if they're interested, but they don't have the ability yet, keeping them warm and keeping them live uh is, is important because they may be working on it and it could be that a year from now they're the best software engineer for 100 miles and you'd be crazy not to not to hire them so we we tried to become we're trying to get more intentional about how we really understand those two things as as different um and in the uh recruitment marketing space um we we've tried to Sorry, I'm repeating myself, but we, we, we've tried to get more intentional, particularly in recruitment marketing. It's a little bit easier for recruiters. I think they're more intuitively close to making these decisions and helping hiring managers and, and candidates match uh, be matchmakers for those two. Um, recruitment marketers are a little bit separated from the actual hiring decisions, so I think that's where that, dis that, that mistake often gets made. Uh, and we're constantly trying to, to reinforce the difference. I hope that was Absolutely. clear. I felt like I stumbled all over myself. <laughs> well, well, we'll give you a little bit of leeway since you're in your secret location and you're many hours ahead of yeah. most of us. I'll tell you what, um, I was interested in making the point. I don't know if I was able to make the point. <laughs> but you're qualified to do it. <laughs> so we should probably keep you around. <laughs> I'm, and I'm going to put you on the spot and I, I apologize because it is late there. When we were prepping, you had mentioned something about someone having a specific skill, a thing, but it doesn't mean that they're qualified. Um, like someone may be able to do programming in X language, but it doesn't mean they're qualified to do X job. Is that ringing a bell? I thought it was a really no. great example. No, it no. sounds like a really <laughs> great, a really wonderful, wonderful example. Uh, I made a great point probably 30 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> No, you have to enlighten me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listeners, we will um, put a pin in this and then we will come back to um, when we send the <laughs> announcement email out or one of us will share on our Twitter specifically uh, what we are talking about. But this, uh, <laughs> this really leads into this chart is both looking at your audience and fitting them into kind of a quadrant of what should you do with them at the same time. So how much effort should you put into nurturing and making sure that they are engaged? And the more that you can understand both their interest and their ability or their qualification to do jobs within your company, the easier it is to understand how high touch you should be with that potential person. And again, it's gonna change over time, um, but how high touch you should be at the time with that specific audience. So one of the things that I hear often is, well, I don't necessarily want to ask people what they're interested in, or I'm not sure what they're interested in, because a lot of companies and a lot of teams don't have the ability to do detailed journey maps 
and personas. And so one of the things that is an easy win is for you to take the data that you already have, the activities that you're already doing, hopefully, inside of your CRM to nurture people and to set it up so that you get data out of it. You know, Tyler, I know you and your team love data. And so why not empower yourself to have a little bit more from your audience? So this is an example from one of our customers. And you can see the employee stories across the top and then the job interest on the left-hand side. This was really from a newsletter. Um, we put a, a source code in there that says all of these stories in this area are tied to employee stories. And then we just looked at who's clicking on it. And you can see that nurses, really not a fan of the employee stories that we've been sending so far. But retail store positions, pharmacists, and pharmacy techs, and pharmacy techs are really scarce right now. All of those folks who are clicking are really interested in employee stories. So if you don't have the bandwidth to go and do the research and the segmentation in advance of getting ready to do this, then just use what you have and let your system and let the people clicking on your content tell you what they're interested in. So you probably guessed by now, um, one of the big things that, again, another takeaway from today is moving from job focus to human focused. You know, nurturing that person where they are in the moment in time. So here are a couple of examples. You know, um, when you hear about a life event, and obviously we don't wanna know about too many of them inside of our systems because that then gets into a whole fun level of protected data that we don't want. But if you just ask a person, are you interested in hearing about maternity programs or maternity leave, they're probably somewhere around a big life event. And so you can send them more information about that. And then make sure that you're organizing your system so that you can get the data back out and understand who is doing what to better inform your strategy. One of the things that comes up all of the time and from most of the customers that I get to work with is I don't know what people are interested in and so I don't know what to send them to even get started. Well, these are a couple of areas that I think in the last year, my team has sent more than, I don't know, eight or nine million emails out to individual contacts across several different customer CRMs. And of those, these are the buckets that always do well. You wanna be helpful for your audience, be relevant. And so give them things that are helpful to them. Job seeker tips, tips professional development, help them as a person develop along their career journey. And then employee generated content, we just saw that that didn't necessarily work for nurses. And so then you would just pivot and share one of the other types. Yeah, I think, you know, what you're talking about in terms of experimentation and really trying to zero in on what what interests people, it's all about listening. Um, and I think another another pitfall I, we, we tend to fall into is to just stand at the megaphone and just kind of shout at the audience. Um, mm -hmm. And... You know, one of the things that really has started to fascinate me over the last, you know, several months is, is, is the role that relationships play in, in listening to people and understanding what they, they want and what they're interested in. Um, you know, part of my role is, is building out our, our, our strategy, our, the technology strategy for, for talent acquisition over the next five, 10 years. What, what, what does that look like? How are we going to be competitive? Uh, and, um, one of the things I, I notice, and be, before, before you go to the next slide, one, one of the things I notice is that most of the strategies I find out there, or most of the technologies I find out there, sorry, are focused on the, on the recruiter and helping the recruiter move faster. Um, but they don't really address the candidate, uh, how, the, how to help the candidate move faster. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a huge benefit that we're missing by not focusing on the candidate. Go to the next slide. Um, we did a, a simple, a very simplistic uh, 
simulation. Uh, what is the benefit we get from automating some of the work of, of a recruiter? And you know, to use an analogy, basically what you're you're doing when you when you use an AI to to match recs to resumes uh, or resumes to recs and 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 activities like that is you, is you're is you're helping you know a recruiter knock doors faster. A lot of the the concepts in recruiting are uh, are or talent acquisition are borrowed from sales and marketing. And if you if you think about a recruiter as a door to door salesperson, um, you know helping them knock doors faster has a certain benefit to a point. However, if, if you can start to tap into um, the candidates that you know and the people that they know and the brand that you've built with the people you've already hired, um, you, you start to get to compound interest. And th this, is, this is actually pretty intuitive if you think about it. In, any of you that have been in town acquisition for any time know that employee referrals are a gold mine. And why is that? It's because it's the relationship that's built. It's that person, that person trusts the person they know way more than they trust you. So one of the things we do, I'm gonna beep, beep, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things we do is we're, we're constantly pulsing our, our uh, candidates and our, our new hires to understand, understand their experience and why it is they made the decisions they made. One of the things that's just fascinating to me is no matter how much effort or how much uh, intent or money we put behind a career site or uh, you know the recruiters and, and just the experience that we provide for candidates, when we ask them why they chose Intel, they say with friends or family. It's almost like, <laughs> it's almost kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, we did all this work, we put all this, effort into to, to building this experience. And it was really about who they knew. It was about that, about that relationship. Um, so one of the things that we, one, one of the things, I've stared at this plot that you're that looking at for, for hours, just trying to kind of really comprehend what this means. What, was, what is the implication here? And one of the things that I've, I've, I've really started to, to hone in on is, is the role of candidate experience here. We talk about candidate experience a lot. We say, oh, we, you know, we, we try to optimize the candidate experience. We try to provide the best of candidate experience. But if the reason they're choosing my company is because the people they already know, then really the candidate experience is, is a deal breaker. It's not a deal maker. It's not the reason they're coming to my company, but it might be a reason they don't come. Um, so what, what, does that, what does that mean? And if, if I'm really focusing on the candidates and what they want, how am I how am I addressing that by just help by only helping my recruiters work faster? Um, what's what's interesting too is that in the recruitment marketing space is that we're we're spending more and more money and more and more time uh, leveraging social media to engage our candidates. And if you're familiar with the the political environment in the U.S. In, at all, uh, one of the things that you'll have seen maybe in the, in the, in the news or, or, or heard discussed is, is the idea of filter bubbles. It's this idea that, that the algorithms behind social media that are, are trying to draw your attention, they're optimized to keep your eyes on that site or on that service. And so they're, they're feeding you content that, that will be interesting to you, which creates a feedback loop. It's just an echo chamber of interest of people that share the same interests as you and uh, sources of information that agree with what you already think. And it's just sort of a reinforced, uh, uh, a, 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 um, ugh, it's too late here. It, it's an echo chamber, <laughs> like it says on the slide. Um, <laughs> it is. So, but if so you think about that, it though, yeah, people that it. are really, people that love their job, are going to tell people they love their job and they're going to hang out with people that also love their job. When they come across somebody that's just negative Nelly, they leave them on the other side of the room. And I think that's, you know, practical example of, of what you're saying here, right? Absolutely. And, and even, even more importantly, let's say that you've, you know, one of the things that Intel is, is doing is it, it's, we're, we're growing into new segments, right? Like every big company, we're trying to increase our, our market. And 
uh, were heavily invested in autonomous driving. Nobody thinks of Intel as an automaker. Uh, we're not making cars, but we're making the components to, to help autonomous vehicles become a reality. Uh, you, if if I have a if I have a friend who gets a job offer from Intel to go work on autonomous vehicles, and I push a bunch of content to them, the burden is now on them to go convince their friends who are also working in in the auto industry that it's a good idea to go work for Intel instead of Tesla. Their friends have all heard of Tesla doing this, but they haven't heard of Intel. And that that candidate now has the burden to go convince their network. So it's really the network that needs to be recruited, like that 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 pod of people. And I need to understand what that network is saying about me, not just the thing that I think the individual wants to hear. And we spend a lot of time focusing on individuals and not the networks. And I think that's the thing that um, that's the nut I'm really trying to crack in terms of. How do we really listen to what people are saying? Because um, employer brand is not about what I said, it's about what they heard. Uh, they are getting this through the filter of the network of people they live in. It's the relationships they have. It's the thing that their dad says about Intel. It's the thing that their uh, aunt thought when she had a, a, a good interview or a bad interview. Um, or her computer network, and all of that information that that candidate is getting um, is is not is not from me. It's primarily from them. Anything I am saying is either validating or or is either reinforcing or challenging what they already think about me. Um, and so the game is more about listening and understanding. I think that's that's an important change in posture uh to to adopt um and what's interesting about about the, this idea of, of listening and, and and people's networks i'm going to shift gears here a little bit is to look at your own employee base um you would think that if somebody is is working at your company um that they would have a, a strong network of people and that would reinforce you know reinforce their incentive to stay. But um, if you go to the beep, there we go. Uh, there we go. Um, 65, what's fascinating is 65% of people say that it's easier to leave their company than to stay. So to put that in perspective, most of our candidates say that they join our company because of a friend or family member which means they have a lot of, the more friends and family members they have that are in the company, the more likely they are to want a job there. Yet 65% of people say it's easier to find a job outside of your company. Those two things seem like they shouldn't coexist. Um, we're, we're actually, the way we engage employees, um, we're actually becoming a hurdle to people staying. And, you know, it, the, the, the idea of internal mobility is more about unlocking or, or freeing our, our employees to stay and to find opportunities with our companies than it is about, you know, projecting messages at them. They, they want to be here. Um, we just need to meet them where they are and show them the opportunities that we have. So, you know, companies like, like you know, every company has, has probably social media accounts at, at this point, but it's really about building the content there that they that is meaningful to them. I'm going to beep you again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, so just us. Uh, these are just two simple examples of, of 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 content that's designed to engage in employees and candidates at the same time. It you know they have the interest. It's really more about unlocking the opportunities for them when we're talking about inter internal mobility. Alan, do you guys do anything for like internal videos? Did, you know, I know we ask employees internal all the time, hey, record this for me. Hey, will you do this for me? Uh, one of the interesting conversations I've started to hear is how do we develop internal content for our internal employees? Like, is, is anything like that on your guys' radar yet? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting you ask that. We, we actually, so, um, we actually have 
when internal when employees apply for jobs, uh, we actually have them do that in such a way that their contact information ends up in in Smashfly as a candidate, just like external employees. And we we use the Smashfly platform to to run campaigns directly to our employees, just like anybody else. We're nurturing emails. Um, we we drive content to them, showing opportunities that we have. Uh, we we let them opt in to our talent networks and and advertise the, the, those talent networks just like we would anybody else. Um, we we have we're exploring using videos, um, but it's mostly been about treating them just like any other candidate um, because I think I think you got to treat every employee. Uh, I think you have to recruit every employee all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So, because yeah. other people are certainly certainly recruiting them, absolutely. Every, everybody is right, Ex exactly. Um, and you know, we have such a huge advantage with our own employees that they we know they have a network, uh, we know that they have the skills, and our job is just to sometimes just get out of their way, show them what. <laughs> what we know that they're interested in and, and get, our, get out of the way. That's awesome. So to, you know, to put a little bit of a cap on, on a few of those things, really using, using the data you have, using the information you have about, even going back and reusing it in employee referral data. You know, someone might have been hired a while ago, or they referred a friend who was never hired, but you know that there's a connection there. Using data like that to drive a, a, a personal experience for people, um, you know, marketing to specific audiences, and really focusing when you're when you're pulling candidates into your or into your CRM, you're driving traffic to your career marketing site. Really focusing on quality over quantity. And when we talk about quality, it's those two uh, dimensions that we talked about earlier. It's both um, interest and ability. Uh, you know, quality isn't a single dimension. It, it's really those two. And someone can fluctuate. And understanding where they are in that space is going to help you understand how to how to how to build a relationship with them. And it's really about the relationship, the long term relationship, not just the they, I opened a rec and I need to hang on to a relationship with them until I've closed the candidate um, and then disposition them. It's, I know about you now and I'm going to keep tabs on you and deliver value to you um, and be there when you may be open to, to position with, with my company. Um, and really, you know, giving that same level of attention to your own employees. Uh, market to them, recruit them, um, and I know a lot of in a lot of places there, there's fear inter fear internally of managers poaching from from each other, and so th there is some cultural challenge within a lot of companies of of breaking those those paradigms. I think managers living under the illusion that they somehow control the talent that works for them, because like you just pointed out, Brandy, even if you know, they're not allowed to move between divisions or groups within a company. Uh, if they're talented, you better believe they're getting recruited by other companies and there's nothing you can do about that. So, um, you know, really empowering employees to, to be able to move, to, to, to see the opportunities within the company. They're there. They have the network, which means they likely have the interest, uh, and again, for like the eighth time, I think I just repeated myself. <laughs> more, it's more about just showing them our tools and getting out of the way. Yeah. And part of that is getting your executive on board with that process so that you can get the stuff out of the way. And I think, so everybody, we said we were going to do a, a point question and make sure everybody was engaged. So this is uh, the first of two. Tyler, take it away. All right. So. Uh, the question is, you know, we're, we're talking about brand and, and what we're putting out to these candidates. Um, how many of you have actually gone through your own uh, brand experience in the last six months? Like, you know, visited your, 
your career marketing site, uh, applied to, to jobs on your own on site. In you the chat, just it. give us a yes or a thumbs up or a smiley face yeah. if you've actually done this. Or a poo emoji, you could do that. I don't know if you can do emojis in that in the in the chat, but kudos if you I think can. Mobile people probably could. Yeah, they probably can. Hopefully, there are no poo emojis. Someone should just to prove they can. Um, <laughs> the other thing, you know, is a kind of a follow-on question to that. I would say, um, ooh, four yeses. Sweet, people are doing it. You're out there. Five. We're counting. As a, as a follow-up <laughs> question, I would ask how many have had or would be willing to have one of your executives or leaders walk through your, your brand experience? Um, would you want them to, uh, to see your career site, to get your, uh, your drip campaigns? Currently tallying. So Tyler, while while people are replying, because we know everybody listening is totally still engaged, um, how did you get your executives to go through this process? I think that having been on you know the talent acquisition side and in your guys' seats, <laughs> my executives wouldn't take the time. Like, how did you possibly get Intel executives to do this? Um, you know it it. It's a challenge. I, I'm not going to go say because you know into a site. Bleh, I'm just going to just <laughs> barf all over this microphone. Um, <laughs> a company the size of Intel has a lot of executives, so I'm not saying we've had a lot or even half a dozen. Um, but within at least HR, uh, you know our our chief talent officer has certainly walked through our um, our entire experience just in the last couple months. Um, we try to, to walk through with, with our, our VP of talent acquisition, make sure that they see what it is and know what it is and, and, and feel good about the experience. Um, we would love to get more, obviously, like, you know, some of the the, the folks, the, the general managers running our, our large verticals at Intel. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the same challenge anyone's going to have. But at least folks who are close to home, we can get them to do it. Yeah, that's a good idea. At least start close to home and then they can amplify from there. Oh, it looks good. Oh, someone's launching a new career site next week. I that's that. exciting. Yeah. So yeah, they're going to take their executives through it. I love that. So from here, um, we're going to start the wrap up and open the line for questions for Raquel. So remember, um, post your questions and we will make sure and answer them if we have time. But the wrap up, first tip number one, understand your process. And, and I realize that sounds really simple, but like Tyler just said, have as high as you can go have executives, have board members, have people who influence the day-to-day -day business go through this process or have their family members do it. You know, a lot of times we'll get referrals from an executive that their son's looking for a job. Well, have their son apply and then tell them how bad the process is because likely it's probably really bad, but you can't understand it if you don't have people go through it. And so that's number one is understand where your pain points are, understand who your audience is, who are the people that you currently have, and speak to them. Begin a conversation, begin building that relationship, even if it's just sending pieces of evergreen content and see who is engaging with what, you're at least providing some value to them as a human, as an employee in this gigantic journey of their career, uh, regardless of what point they're in. Tip number two, stop treating brand experiences like veneer conversations. <clears throat> and this is where we are, we're deciding to blow up the funnel. The funnel still exists in a specific rec environment. Recruiters on the line are gonna say, look, we've, we've gotta have funnels. 
because that's how I know that I am doing my job and finding the people and getting them through the process and we're getting them to a hire. Absolutely, and we agree. What we're also saying is that all the rest of the people you run across in the way or the people that you really like but aren't qualified today, make sure and do something with them. Put them in the CRM, invite them to stay in the talent community so that you can keep an eye on them or someone, your recruitment marketing team, can keep an eye on them over time and create that relationship with them. And then finally, create messages considering the life events and the emotions and the experiences that your prospects are going through at any given time. So change the conversation. Ask them if they want to hear about cool programs that your company is doing instead of just what their area of interest in doing their job might be. So Tyler might be interested in talent acquisition or might be interested in analytics, but Tyler's also a human and a tired one at that. And so we probably want to talk to Tyler about work-life balance or taking time off or international <laughs> travel. You never know, right? But I, I need to ask Tyler as a potential prospect what's important to him and then be able to nurture him in that way, not just talk to him about the job that he may do inside of my company. Tyler, would you agree? Yeah, right now, talking work-life balance, I'm, I'm in. Whatever you're <laughs> <laughs> I figured that would be appropriate. <laughs> yeah. So those are those are our high level tips. Um, we really hope you guys have taken a couple of nuggets away from this, and we're going to pass it over to Raquel and um, to do a quick plug for our very exciting event that's coming up. And actually, you see Tyler on the stage. A Lynn Bailey is right center. She is leading the Infinity Loop dance, which if you guys haven't seen. Make sure you go on Twitter and look up the Infinity Loop dance. And then Tyler's in the back right corner back there, also leading the dance from the stage. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really, really, <laughs> Alin, Alin is like the uh, the queen of the Infinity Loop. I call it the Alinity Loop just because it's funny. But, uh, <laughs> it's her, her thing for sure. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Tyler and Brandy. So uh, with our remaining about 10 minutes here, I'll move into the Q&A portion. Uh, we've got a lot of great questions coming in from all of you. So we'll try to get through as many of those as we can. Um, but first, I uh, wanted to let everybody know here that the wait list for Transform 2020 is officially open. Um, so you can sign up at smashfly.com slash join transform waitlist. And that way you'll be the first to know about the event details, early bird registration, discounts, and get a sneak peek at the speaker lineup, um, which is Tyler and Brandy mentioned included these two awesome presenters last year. So we're super excited to be coming back in 2020. So now let's get to our first question. Okay. So Tyler, how does Intel manage the process of finding and then communicating with matches uh, between interested and qualified applicants at scale? That's a great question. Um, you know, this is something that we're we're working on getting good at. So what that is code for is that we're not very good at it, uh, but we understand that it's that it's an issue. I one way that we're we're looking at this is to be very careful about you know when somebody look at, looking at how people apply, the the way they interact with our career marketing site gives us. It gives us some clues about what they're interested in, right? So we we have a series of talent forms that we we create, um, our landing pages on our, our career site that are are more about in, they're more about interest, right? So people that are interested in careers in AI, right? We have a, a we, we direct them to a a careers landing page um, rather than directly to to jobs. We also look at how they apply, like I said. Um, and then collecting their resumes and other information that gives us clues about their abilities, we now have somewhere to start. And I know that that's very basic. It's things that you probably already have. Um, but by keeping them separate, we can start to look at other more advanced ways to do that. So, you know, the role that assessments play. Um, and both engage, engage, engaging both, uh, both interest and ability. 
we can start to enrich that information as we bring on those those capabilities and we plug them directly into our um, our CRM or um, or our, our ATS. I, I feel like I danced around that a little bit, but um, we're really on the beginning of this journey. And the first big step is just to recognize the, the difference. I think there's a lot of opportunities in, in the, the TA tech space um, with some companies that are doing some cool things that can help you scale uh, beyond just using phone screening to, to engage, engage both or to, man, my, my tongue is just okay, falling out of my mouth. <laughs> Um, <laughs> to assess both. So I think assessments is going to be the big arms race uh, over the next 10 years in the, in the TA tech space to really evaluate both those things. Great. Thanks, Tyler. Hi, about thank time. you, guys. Oh, sorry. sorry I was right say, it's a, no, I was going to say, and it's about 10 p.m. local time for Tyler right now. Yeah. Um, I think you guys also do a great job of stacking information when you learn something else about a contact. To say someone came in through the AI form and then someone else, that same person also came in through a machine learning form, you begin to understand that contact. And I think this is part of what you've trained the organization to do is understand that contact as a direction that they're interested in versus bucketing them into maybe a data scientist you look at the individual places they've interacted and start to understand that they might be interested in this business unit because it handles machine learning and AI versus putting them into a larger bucket. I think you guys do that really well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that, that, that I'm glad you brought that up. So that, that is one thing that we do is really understanding that the, the landing pages we have in our career site aren't mutually exclusive. And in fact, it's a great thing if, we have, I think we have 11 or 12 of them. Um, if somebody is interested or clicks on or, or, or fills out one of our, our talent forms in three or four, that's a good thing. That tells us that we have three or four hooks or interest, points of interest to engage that, that candidate. And we really try to enrich that, that interest, that information about their interests. Um, it's, it's not a bad thing. I, I think there's a temptation to try to make life simple by bucketing them into one or the other and go, oh, well, they they went to both our hardware landing page and our AI page. So are they AI or are they hardware? Well, they're, they're both and that's okay. Great. Uh, so our next question, um, what examples could we use to empower employees? Uh, newsletter examples in particular would be helpful. Is that for me or Brandy? Uh, either one. I think it's an open one. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what we mean by empower employees. Um, Taylor, does that resonate with you right off? Well, that was on the that was on the slide. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I think empower employees. To me, there's a. There's a sense, at least with within our own company, sometimes that employees feel like they can't move or that it's not okay to to look at jobs internally, or you know, my manager will get mad if they find out. Um, I think empowering employees, part of it is really exposing them to the the breadth of opportunities within your company. Um, you know, even if their job title doesn't match, that their their capabilities match. Um, and there's a there is a career path or a, a, a series of, of paths they could follow um, within the company. Um, I've lost track of the, the original question. I was started answering the oh the newsletter content. Employee. Yeah, or I, I can take the other half if you'd like. Yeah, take the other half. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, now that I realize where the question came from, sorry guys. Um, I, even just exposing internally to newsletter content, exposing the apply process. So one, making sure how all hiring managers and all people who have recs open are adhering to the process. And then educating employees on what it is. It may not be pretty, but if you empower them with the knowledge of how they can move and connect them with other people who have moved inside of the company to get tips, you know, and as Tyler said, if your company doesn't necessarily worry about a job title match or doesn't worry about 
certain aspects because an employee is internal, then educate the internal base on that. And that allows them to facilitate a conversation if that's the next step. Um, and the other part is providing resources like professional development links or um, free opportunities that the company might be sponsoring, any way to enrich them as a human on that journey inside of your company um, is a really way, great way to empower them. That's a great point, and I think also kind of leads to our uh, another question that we got that's somewhat related, which is, um, I'm the head of a uh, HCM uh, at an ICT company, um, but the attrition rate in my company is presently very high for this year. What can I do differently to keep talent for a longer period of time? And I, it sounds like a lot of those examples you just gave um, might help to you know keep people in their seats a little bit longer. Yeah, I think potentially. Um, my first reaction, and, and, and I've been in a similar environment, is getting real about what's actually happening. You know, a lot of times there may be a disconnect between the recruitment marketing message, what the recruiters are saying to get people into the role, and then what happens when they get into the role itself or the, the managers that they may be working for. Um, diving into that and facing it head on. You know, if, if the baby is ugly, call the baby ugly. It may not be thrilled with your executive team. They may not love the approach, but um, just that level of transparency and authenticity to employees versus saying everything is great and you should stay, you'll see a direct impact in those two things. Tyler, what do you think? Yeah, and I, I, I agree. I think, you know, to the statement I made earlier about it's about what they heard, not about what you said. Understanding mm -hmm. to, to call to call the baby ugly, so to speak. <laughs> um, you know, that's only helpful if they already thought it was ugly and you're just sort of speaking truth to power, right? So um, really getting in and, and sensing what the actual concerns are will help you speak to them. I think the other thing is understanding who their network is. Do they have a network? If they have no network, if they have no support, and it's not about assigning a buddy, right? Who are the people that they actually um, engage with and trust? If they don't have any within your company, they're not going to stay. It doesn't matter what you campaign to them or how much money you offer them. Um, I want the, what's, One of the advice I got from somebody once was, you could have the world's best boss and the world's worst job and you'll stick around. You could have the world's best job and the world's worst boss and you're out of there. So, you know, to me that's just, I, I think about that when I, when I look at these networks and I look at, at the relationships people have within the company. So help, help people build those networks. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think we maybe have time for one last question if you guys are up for it. I'm into it. Great. Um, okay, so given the tight labor market, um, what has been your experience uh, if you've had any pushback on retaining or hiring a worker uh, with 15 plus years experience, for example? Um, how do you suggest to build relationships with people who are later in their career but are extremely highly skilled as well? Uh, if 15 years is later in your career, I think we're all screwed. <laughs> 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 I, I have not seen that as pushback for retaining somebody that's mid-career. I'd call that more mid-career, right? But uh, mid-late career. I've not seen that as an issue. I've seen, in fact, the opposite. We're, we're trying to hang on to those people because mm -hmm. they've got experience. I don't know, Brandy, something different? It's understand the human <laughs> um, is probably my best guidance. It goes back to build out the what is the person, what are the drivers of that role? You know, you said they're highly skilled and they're mid or late career, whichever term we want to use. And so what what is driving them at this moment in time based on their mid career, based on um, the team that they're on, the function that they're in, the skills that they have, you know, do some external research and do some internal research to be able to connect with them in a better way, to be able to promote them and or keep them, I think. Great. All right. So I think we've hit the three o'clock mark. So uh, thank you both. I think we all learned um, 
a lot about retention and candidate interest and really how to connect people um, on a more human level. So thank you both, especially to you, Tyler, uh, for sticking in with us. Um, you know, late in the night for you out in Tel Aviv. Uh, so thanks everybody. Um, we'll be back in touch later this week with the recording from today and all of the slides. You can keep those handy. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.